Howdy guys. Okay, a little bit of a diversion from the usual uh, topic. Um, this is a uh, headphone amplifier build project from a kit. It's called the Millet Hybrid Minimax. Uh, there's probably lots of uh, clips about this up on the net. Um, but uh, I thought I'd uh, share the experience with you guys. So, in the kit, you get a digital multimeter. How about that? You get a trimmer tool. Pretty neat. You get the case um, with the decals and panels and stuff. All the components. There are multiple options around gain. Um, so, the standard kit comes with two sets of valves. You can pick low or medium gain. There's also a, another set for high gain, so I ordered those up as well. You get all the hardware, bits and pieces, um, connectors and knobs and stuff, and you get a wall wart. Uh, <coughs> the only disappointment so far is the wall wart is 115 volt only. I would usually, or 120 volt. I would kind of assume most wall warts would be universal these days. Um, would take either side of the pond. Um, so, uh, I mean, I can put it in the Variac when the time comes, uh, but yeah, that's the only disappointment so far. Uh, I guess the first thing uh, that surprised me a little bit when I unpacked everything is there was no actual formal set of instructions. There's this little document, which is called the notes on the uh, Millet Hybrid Minimax. Uh, that's just the uh, shipping note. Um, which basically warn thing it tells you things you have to be really careful of and pay special attention to and etc etc. Uh, and in there somewhere it tells you basically for full details of how you build it, go to a website. Um, <coughs> gives the link on the top here. Uh, and the only other thing that's included is a component list um, with a part ID and where you can get them uh, and typical pricing etc etc. Um, which is undoubtedly going to come in handy. So I went to the website, and uh, yeah, that's pretty decent instructions, uh, and photographs, and all sorts of step-by-step -step instructions on putting it together. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, there's a bunch of decisions to get made beforehand because depending on what gain you select and all that sort of stuff, certain components in the circuit change. Um, and yeah, there is uh, for the uh, since these uh, low voltage uh, tubes don't really generate any light um, for those people who really need to see light coming out of the uh, of the valves, um, you have the option of putting little LEDs underneath. Um, and so I got to give that a go. Um, unfortunately, the uh, the tube sockets are ceramic and. Uh, Drilling the hole in the middle is a little bit of a, a trick, so uh, we'll address that first, and if that works out, uh, we'll be back with some more. Oh, and I forgot, it's all uh, mounted on a PCB, which goes into the uh, extruded case. So, uh, hopefully, that'll be, uh, make the job easier. So this is uh, one of the ceramic uh, valve sockets. Um, and as you can see, there is no hole down the center, so... Um, but apparently this metal pin, you drill it out, uh, and the socket is in two halves, an upper and lower, and when you take that uh, metal pin out, then the two halves come apart. You then have to glue it back together, um, so that it's all one piece again, and then you have a hole through from which the LED can shine through. So... Uh, I'm going to have a go at that and see if I can do it without breaking the uh, ceramic socket. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the socket when you take the rivet that, or that's basically uh, holding the two halves together. Um, and so now all i got to do is find a suitable glue, epoxy, whatever, that's going to hold two pieces of uh, ceramic material together. Um, and then we're, uh, we can carry on. So the book says, or the instructions say, a uh, way to glue the two halves of the valve sockets together is either with some uh, two-part epoxy 
or some thick uh, super glue. So I've never had that much luck with thick super glue, and especially porous surfaces. So I and I've heard that um, super glue is not that brilliant in high temperature scenarios. And it does say that these things draw a fair bit of current, hence the ceramic sockets, not plastic. Um, so it went with the uh, epoxy and not with super glue, and we'll see how that goes. So the next piece of pre-assembly work it says to do is to mount the uh, output transistors on the heat sinks, uh, paying careful attention to how you orient them, um, but to not do it, uh, to just not tighten them up because you don't solder this whole thing in until much later on. Um, but they're actually symmetric, so you can put it, you could screw it up later. Um, but okay, that's that bit done. I guess we can finally get on to start soldering at this point. Okay, I think uh, we stop here for the first round of this. Um, so a lot of the uh, major passives are now in fitted on the board. Um, from my perspective, it's not really a fun kit to build. Um, these resistors are tiny. The hole spacing is too narrow in the sense that it's just the the uh, the hole spacing is a, effectively the length of the resistor with no allowance for the bend radius on the leads to put them in. So it means for each of these resistors, you have to bend the lead down and then around under the resistor. Um, so it's a bit of a pain. As well as that, the values on these resistors are written as a code number on one uh, side of the resistor. So you, when you install them, you have to make sure that code number is up. Otherwise, you got no way later on when you're troubleshooting of testing whether you um, put the right resistor in the right place. Um, so that's equally uh, unpleasant. Um, the nomenclature for the components, to me, I don't know what the logic is, but for instance, there is, for each of these resistors, you have like an RA1R, an RB1R, or an RB1L. It, you have so many R1s, and so many R2s, and so many R3s, it's just, why did I just number these things sequentially? I have no idea. Um, uh, what else? Um, yeah, so like this is like R something two is one of the R twos right here. So then when you're looking for R three and R four, they're right down the other end of the board. They're down here somewhere, um, which again doesn't make it too easy. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, you spend a lot of time faffing around. Um, the instructions basically say you install the components essentially in the order of their height. So you do the resistors first, then you do the you know diodes, and then you do the transistors, and then you build it up. And uh, well, my training was install passives first and install semiconductors last. So I'm just going to do that. Um, so um, yeah. Uh, so uh, next I'll get on and uh, install all the caps and stuff. And then we'll do the semiconductors. Okay, so at this stage it's pretty much built up. Um, as you can see, the component density is very high. Um, and as always, there's gotches along the way. Uh, for instance, uh, the diodes here for the power supply. Uh, these leads just barely fit down the hole in the board and again the hole spacing is too short so you have to bend the lead back underneath the component which means it ends up standing up a little bit off the board which in this case is okay because if these guys ever go which I'm sure uh, can't happen um, they damage the board when they burn so I'm not worried about that however what I did discover is I decided I put the uh, the underband of the component on the side away from the edge of the board so it looked nicer uh, but there just isn't enough room against this heatsink here so when I put the heatsink in I, I discovered the heatsink was actually touching one end of the diode here it was almost touching over here 
So I've had to sort of bend them out of the way so they're not touching. Um, these Michikan caps have no marking on them anywhere on the casing to indicate positive and negative. So you're totally reliant on the fact that they conform to the convention that the longer of the two leads is the positive. Uh, that's a little disappointing. Um, but basically we're all there. It's all put together. It's all done. Um, so before we can go setting anything up, um, I guess we have to put it together. So the front panel mounts to the components and so the front panel fits on nicely to the board. Uh, the back panel doesn't fit on at all. So you have all these, uh, which I have to obviously look up exactly how you wire this because these three points are for setting up the biasing of the tubes. Um, interestingly you have what appear to be nice gold plated input funnels, uh, but a regular uh, non-gold plated uh, headphone jack. Um, so yeah, um, so again, because the case for the uh, uh, amp is a solid extruded piece, um, you can slide all this in from the front. Um, but So I'm assuming what you have to do is put flying leads from all the points that need to go to the back panel, poke them at the back, put it all in, and then wire it up at the back. So you kind of have to set it up with the whole thing in the case otherwise you gotta uh, do it out like this where you temporarily wire things up uh, and then when you get it done uh, disconnect all these connections again so you can put that through um, at least that it seems like for now so uh, yes uh, we're getting there Okay, I think I have it uh, pretty much set up at this point, um, and so I just gotta get it back in the case. Um, so there's essentially two uh, biases that have to be set up. So there's there's uh, this solid state, what they call diamond buffer uh, stage. It has to get um, essentially uh, uh, equal current flow in each channel here. Um, and so you do it by measuring across two points where you just measure the voltage drop, uh, which equates to the current, obviously. Um, I'm not quite sure how you would do that if it was all back in the cabinet or in the case, which I think was the goal. So what I did was I soldered two fly leads out of each channel um, so that I could measure, if you like, the, uh, the millivolts on each side. And then as the thing heated up and stabilized, keep going back and forth. Um, to check. Um, uh, so yeah, that's okay. Uh, so that looks like that's pretty much done. And then the other one is the bias for the tubes, which essentially is uh, uh, you just, for each one it's half of the total supply. So since you're set to 27 volts DC, each one is set to 13 and a half. Um, okay, so uh, Unfortunately, the way this thing is designed, I have to unwire the back panel and put it all together and then rewire the back panel. Um, so that's a little unfortunate, but I didn't want to put this thing in the case uh, and have to set it up inside the case. Um, I can always tweak it again once it's back in there. Um, okay, let's put it back in that and put it in its uh, case. So here's the back panel wired up. Um, there is almost no clearance between the back of these studs here and the uh, power supply heatsink. So uh, I decided to route all the wires vertically down from the connectors so that they wouldn't be sticking back into the cab. So, just got to get back together, see if it works. Okay guys, there we go, all back, all done. Um, of course, there's always a sods law. So one of the little tiny black screws that holds the uh, front panel on I fell on the floor and slipped into an alternative dimension. Um, so I can only hope that it uh, doesn't stay in the other dimension too long. And when I look again, I'll find it. Um, but uh, yeah, interesting project. Uh, so uh, sounds pretty nice. I'm using it on the Sennheiser. I had to uh, put in the high gain valves because the original ones I put in didn't quite have enough gain. It was turned up almost the whole way all the time. Um, so I put in the high gain, the highest gain, uh, and it's superb. So yeah, nice sound, and uh, yeah, overall I'm pleased with this one. 
Um, so enough of this trivia, back to the serious stuff. Uh, the quad electrolytic and the replacement caps have arrived for the Dyna tuner, so uh, we'll get back to that one.